So I want to talk a little bit about tools and creativity. The way I see it is uh, any kind of creative process, any person that's doing anything creative is drawing on some kind of a skill set, or I like to think of it as kind of a toolbox. Um, if you're a mechanical designer, you're actually maybe using physical tools in the real world if you're a carpenter or something like that. If you're a musician, uh, some of your tools might include music theory, the training that you've had, your instruments. Uh, a couple of my favorite toolboxes that I use for different creative processes are uh, teamwork, the design process, and analysis tools that I use for engineering as a mechanical engineer. And then uh, another tool set that sounds like this. And I'll get a little more into that in a second. So I'm one of the many people in the world who I think agrees that increasingly we need much more creative, innovative, broad thinking problem solvers, designers, and engineers. Uh, but if you want to inspire that next generation of engineers, what do you do when most of the information that you know, a kid would get about an engineer is that either they're A, a uh, person that wears overalls and a striped hat to drive a train, or B, is a, you know, a, a nerdy math and science whiz that huddles in a lab and does kinds of work that normal people can't comprehend. Um, it's a bit of a challenge. The way I think that it should be done uh, is to relate all the creative aspects of the engineering process to the things that kids already love. And the fact of the matter is that if you look at the artistic process versus engineering problem solving, the two processes are incredibly similar. Whether you're in a team of engineers that needs to design a new bridge or uh, a jazz quartet writing a new song, it's a really similar process and it's all collaborative and I think that's what we need to stress. If you're in a jazz quartet, you know, you're starting to throw out a bunch of musical ideas, it's, it's very similar to a brainstorming session. You're going to go and revise the ideas just like you would in an engineering context. You're going to do some creative problem solving to make sure that the ideas you're revising are fitting into the framework to solve the problem that you need to solve. And eventually you create a prototype, you make the song, and you're on your way. Now, I grew up in a pretty musical and creative household, and I started kind of conceptualizing this idea of a toolbox when I started making drum noises with my mouth. Now, I was a pretty young kid. I was playing a lot of piano at the time. And uh, I hadn't heard anything about beatboxing. I had no idea what it was. Um, all I knew was that I heard some cool stuff on the radio. I wanted to emulate it. Uh, the piano wasn't quite giving me the creative toolbox that I wanted. And uh, so I started making drum noises with my mouth. I'd, I'd come up with a little kick drum noise to help do that. And then uh, figured out how to add some snare drum sounding noises. And before long, I could kind of create a beat that I was hearing on the radio. You know, similar things to... And the really fun part came when I realized that the more crazy noises I made up, the more I could express neat, fun, creative ideas, and this concept of the, the sort of toolbox began to grow. And particularly when I figured out that the things I was studying more formally in piano, doing scales, arpeggios, different theory, things like that, that helped um, build the, the repertoire that I could do with piano, I started applying those same concepts to the beatboxing stuff. And my mom was one of my teachers. She always said to practice slow. And so I started doing beats pretty slow so I could bounce them around different parts of the mouth and, and kind of make things go faster. So I started doing things like double tongue and it's just a T and a K back and forth. Uh, the slower I did that, the more consistently I could do it. I could make it go a little faster. And then it, all of a sudden the beats started to transform and I could do a whole lot more. and then started the noises. Now this was the really fun kind of thing. I wanted to make a robot voice more than you can believe. I loved robots. And it, you know, it's, it's kind of a hard thing to do with your throat, but I started messing around with the ideas and trying to build this, this toolbox. And pretty soon I figured out I could do a growl, <sighs> kind of match a tone. I figured out if I could do a growl and then put my voice on that tone at the same time. <laughs> All of a sudden, I had a brand new voice box that I could add to the creative beatboxing with. And the toolbox crew. Now. <laughs> Thanks. Now, at the same time, uh, I grew up without TV, so my sisters and I were always doing a whole lot of creative stuff instead of watching television. The other things I was doing at home were building things in the backyard. Now, I loved making stuff. I was playing Legos indoors and building with blocks, but outdoors I was building potato guns and you know catapults and all sorts of fun things. The funny thing was, I had no idea that the math and the science stuff I was learning in school could be applied as part of a toolbox to another creative thing that I loved to do. 
Uh, for me at the time, you know, math and science were things that were going to be useful someday, um, but I had no idea that they could be exciting and, and helpful to what I was excited about right then. That realization didn't come to me until college after I was partly into my engineering career. I was sitting there in a thermodynamics class doing exactly the same thing. It was in one ear, just enough retention to pass a test, and then out the other ear. And I knew that someday I could relearn thermodynamics if I needed to. Uh, <laughs> We were getting into some stuff about uh, you know, keeping CO2 at the right pressure and temperature so that you can have it as a liquid and tote it around in different uh, you know, cans for storage and things. And all of a sudden, I figured out, wait, that's how a paintball gun works. <laughs> Click. <laughs> for me, that was super exciting. It was a discovery that you know, the things I was learning in my coursework were applicable to something I was already excited about trying to build. And all of a sudden, that loop closed. The classes that I was taking became part of the toolbox for doing something exciting and creative that I was passionate about. So, also at the same time, I was continuing doing some music things. And as this awareness of how the, the toolboxes were kind of similar began to grow, um, I started noticing how in an engineering design class, when I was in a brainstorming session with a number of people, when it was getting really creative and people were bouncing ideas off of each other, it felt like improvising in a jazz group it felt exactly the same way. Uh, you know, you're, you've got a general theme that you're working off of, but you get some offshoots that build into new things, and all of a sudden, each person is creating more and more incredible ideas than they ever would on their own. And it was the same thing as, as when you're playing in, you know, in a jazz quartet and, and things are or any kind of jazz group where things are tight. You start anticipating each other, you start being so much on the same page in the same wavelength that it just flows. The other thing I started to notice was that the better of tools and skills and preparations I was bringing to each of those venues, the more meaningful of a contribution I was able to make. So if I had been practicing a whole bunch of my chord progressions and jazz and arpeggio stuff, if I was bringing better chops to the jam session, I could do more. I could be more expressive with myself and in the group. In the same way, if I was showing up to an engineering design you know, problem-solving session with, uh, with better skills, I'd actually study the thermodynamics this time, I knew how stuff worked and I could make more meaningful contributions in that, in that crowd as well. And then I began also noticing engineering popping up in a whole lot of other venues. And particularly, uh, I started kind of noticing how this one performance that completely captured what I was totally excited about as a beatboxer, and this is the performance that made me discover what beatboxing was. And that's Rozelle doing If Your Mother Only Knew. Uh, now, Rozelle is a really famous beatboxer who really popularized the form, brought it into the, you know, much more of a public forum where people realized how incredible of an expressive art it could be. And he did that through doing the beat and the chorus at the same time. Now, it's an incredible performance. It, it captured the mind and totally blew my mind as a kid that was just trying to make drum noises with my mouth. And so I want to take you through that. But I want to explain too how this was a disruptive performance, a disruptive innovation for musical expression in exactly the same way that technologies can be disruptive, like the iPhone, in that it defies expectation and it redefines what people think is possible with the form. So I want to take you through this. Raza will start off with a really simple, basic beatboxing beat. And then I'll introduce the chorus. If your mother only knew if your mother only knew. And it's an engineered performance. So he gets the crowd on the edge of their seat. And he says, now's the tricky part. I'm going to do the beat and the chorus at the same time. And he's so masterful at manipulating the audience that everybody's on the edge of their seat and they're listening for it. So I think even if he botched the performance, people's brains would just fill in the rest of it because they wanted to hear it so bad. <laughs> but he nails it. And it blew my mind as a kid trying to learn how to beatbox. And it goes like this. If your mother only knew. If your mother only knew. If your mother only knew. That you were drop iron to get with me. So, <laughs> thanks. And so he just does a masterful job with this performance. And for me as a kid that was trying to make drum noises with my, mouth, with my mouth, I was thrilled. I had no idea such a thing was possible. And I had to figure it out. 
And so what did I do? I went to basic principles I learned in math class. I didn't realize it at the time, but I just had to break apart the problem into smaller pieces, solve each of those individually, and then put it back together to create a whole solution. Um, and so I was able to do that. I started thinking the more we can emphasize how the stuff that you're learning in the math and science classes can be applied to things that you're excited about right now, um, the more you can turn on a kid who loves being creative and solving problems onto the engineering track and, and being in a position to solve bigger and better problems all the time. I mean, think about trying to inspire a kid to become an engineer by saying, you know, if you study math and science really hard, someday you can become an engineer and maybe you'll make an incremental improvement to a manufacturing process overseas someplace. How's that sound? That's not going to turn on the kid to engineering, and it's also not the type of engineer that we need in the world that can think dynamically, creatively, draw disparate things together to solve bigger problems, right? How about if you become an engineer, you can use creative problem solving with people that will excite you and, and you know, bring together different ideas to make differences in the world for people that you care about. That's much more of a compelling thing. And it's just a different tool set. It's just a different skill set. You can use the math and the science things that you're doing right now to be able to do that. And so as the host of Design Squad on PBS, that's exactly the type of thing that we've tried to introduce, is that there are hands-on proje projects that we do on the show that you know, kids can find exciting and relate to what they're interested in. So you pit two teams of teenage engineers together on the show, and they get a new challenge every week. And those challenges vary widely from you know, making an automatic pancake making machine for a, a chef in a diner that can't make pancakes fast enough to even fashion design. And the kids do a problem-solving session and create prototypes of garments that transform on stage from one thing into another. And it shows how engineering can be applied all over the place into things that they find interesting and exciting right now. So as far as I can see, we need to inspire the next generation of engineers and innovators and designers to be able to draw from what excites them with an engineering skill set to be able to solve the bigger problems of the world. And that's the way to do it. Thanks.